In this lecture, I'm going to talk about epithelium. Epithelium is one of the four basic tissues of the body. The other three are connective tissues, muscle and nerve. Epithelium is very important to understand because it's located in most organs of the body. And if you can identify the different sorts of epithelium, and you know the different functions of each of these epitheliums, then it's very important and very easy for you to understand then the structure of organs and being able to identify different organs. At the end of this lecture, I would like you to understand the following. Firstly, that epithelial cells are orientated in certain ways. They're also classified or named differently depending on how they appear and also in some instances, their functions. They have certain surface specializations that have a very important role in some parts of the body. Epithelial cells are very tightly held together by junctional complexes, and I'll explain the different types of junctional complexes. Epithelia are also very tightly anchored to underlying connective tissue. Let me just summarise what the main functions of epithelia are, and then we'll look at the structures of the epithelia that serve these particular functions. Epithelia cover body surfaces. A skin is an example. Skin is the external covering of the body. It's a very specialised epithelium, and I'll talk about skin specially in another lecture. Epithelia lines the body cavities, such as the thoracic cavity, the pleural cavity, and the abdominal cavities. It also lines tubes. Some of those tubes are external to the body, such as the respiratory passages, the gastrointestinal tract, and some tubes are internal, such as blood vessels. Epithelia also form secretory tissues or glands and also the ducts or conduits that carry the secretory product of these glands to the surface. And they're also, in special instances, receptors. And we'll learn about those in more detail when we look at uh, the ear and the tongue and olfactory epithelium in the nasal cavity and also the eye. It's very important, first of all, to understand what the characteristics of epithelium are. It has three major characteristics that really identify epithelia. Firstly, each of the epithelial cells has an apex or a surface that's adjacent to the lumen, which is often a hollow tube. Here, you see a section through a collecting duct in the kidney. You don't need to understand the details of the kidney at this stage, but just have a look at this image. Have a look at the section through this tube identify the lumen and identify the epithelial cells. They stain light pink. Some you can see have a nice round nucleus. In other instances you can't see the nucleus because the section just hasn't passed through that part of the cell. But these epithelia all have a surface that opens into the lumen, which is that clear area in the center. Epithelia also have a lateral border, and that lateral border has very important functions. And that's where junctional complexes occur to hold these epithelial cells very closely together. All epithelia sit on a basement membrane, and therefore are anchored to underlying connective tissue. We call that underlying connective tissue lamina propria. And I'll be talking about lamina propria a number of times in this lecture and also in other lectures. Let's now look and see how epithelium is classified or named. Well, the first thing to do when you look at an epithelium is decide how many cell layers make up the epithelium. If there's only one cell layer, as you see in these diagrams, we call the epithelium a simple epithelium. And the second thing we do is we look at the shape of the cells. If the cells are a lot wider than they are in height, 
or they're flattened, we call it a squamous epithelium, a simple squamous epithelium. If the height, the width, and the depth of the cell is about the same, we call it a simple cuboidal epithelium. And if the height is far greater than both the width and the depth, then we call it a simple columnar epithelium. Sometimes the epithelial cells or the epithelial layers may have many more cells, not just the one cell. In that case, we call the epithelium stratified. And again, we further extend that classification depending on the shape of the surface cells. They could be squamous at the surface, so we call it a squamous non-keratinized epithelium or a stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. The surface cells may be cuboidal, so we call it a stratified cuboidal epithelium. Or, as we see in skin, the surface cells may be keratinized, so we call it a stratified keratinized epithelium. Rarely, we may find an epithelial surface that is stratified and the surface cells are columnar. In that case, it's called a stratified columnar epithelium. There are a few unusual epithelia, such as the ones shown here. If you look at the pseudo-stratified epithelium in this diagram, the nuclei of the epithelium appear to be at different levels or different heights. And it gives you the impression that that epithelium is stratified. But in actual fact, if you look at sections through this epithelium using an electron microscope, you'll see that all the cells sit on the basement membrane. So although it appears to be stratified, it isn't. It's simple. So we call this a pseudo-stratified epithelium. And sometimes on the surface of these cells, there are special Lysations that I'll talk about later on. There could be cilia or microvilli. Sometimes we more, might call this a pseudo-stratified ciliated epithelium. The other two diagrams show a section through or a representation of the epithelium in the bladder or parts of the urinary passages. We call this a transitional epithelium because when the bladder is relaxed or emptied, the cells adopt a rather stratified cuboidal appearance. But when the bladder distends and fills with urine, then the surface cells tend, tend to flatten out. In other words, the epithelium goes through a transition from one appearance to another, depending on the state of the bladder. Hence the name transitional epithelium. Now here is an example of a simple cuboidal epithelium. You've seen this picture before. The cells are both the same height, width and depth, hence the cuboidal classification. Now, epithelia really carry out four major functions. And if you're aware of those four major functions, sometimes it's easy to assign those functions to the particular epithelia. We saw earlier with the simple squamous epithelium, the function was a very effective transcellular transport, very thin. Other epithelia, such as the one shown here, the simple cuboidal epithelium, are designed for very efficient absorption and also secretion of material. This happens to be the epithelium of the collecting duct, as I pointed out earlier. And these collecting ducts are very busily both absorbing and also secreting materials. Here is a simple columnar epithelium, again specialised for absorption and secretion. Often when the cell is very, very busy, they get very, very tall and the nucleus packs down to the basal area of the cell. Now, if you look at the shape of these nuclei, they're elongated towards the luminal surface. When you see elongated nuclei, it's a fairly good indication that the cells are columnar. Whereas in the previous slide, you may have noticed that the cell nuclei were nice and rounded. 
when you see rounded nuclei, you can be pretty sure that the epithelium is a cuboidal type of epithelium. Well, here's a stratified epithelium designed to be a barrier to protect. It's a wear and tear type epithelium. It's found in places like the oral cavity, the vagina, the esophagus, places where there's significant wear and tear. And the cells are lost as they move towards the surface. They're rapidly produced in the basal part of the epithelium and those cells move to the surface. And as they move to the surface, they change their shape and are lost to the surface as a result of wear and tear. That's the fourth major function of an epithelium. And that's why this epithelium is structured in this way. Remember the four functions, trans, cellular transport, absorption or secretion, or both, and here, wear and tear. Sometimes you have a epithelial surface, such as the one shown here, of pseudo-stratified epithelium. And remember that although the nuclei here seem to be at different heights, all the cells are sitting on the basement membrane. Well, this epithelium also has surface specializations on it that I'll explain it later on. These surface specializations are cilia and they can transport secretions along the surface, foreign bodies, and also cells in certain organs. They're mainly associated with pseudostratified epithelium, as you see here. You can also see pale secreting cells in this epithelium. They're secreting material onto the surface, whereas the darker stain cells are absorbing. So sometimes in an epithelium, you can have a number of cells performing the functions of that epithelium. Here's a section through the urinary tract, the bladder. And on the left hand side, you can see the cells have a cuboidal type of appearance. It's very thick epithelium, but they're flattened on the right hand image when the bladder is distended. And at the apex of the cells, particularly those on the surface, you can see rather an eosinophilic or a pink or reddish stain. They're special plaques inside the epithelial cells that prevent water and also salt from passing across the epithelial surface. And that's very important in the urinary tract and in the bladder because the kidney goes through a lot of work, a lot of functions to make sure that we get rid of excessive electrolytes from our body, such as salt. Well, we don't want that absorbing back into the body through the bladder. That would defeat the purpose of our kidneys. So it's important that in this epithelium, they have this special role of resisting the transport of water and salt. Often this epithelium is also called urothelium. Now here's an example of stratified squamous keratinized epithelium, skin. In the very top part of the image, you can see some purple stained material. That's keratin. It's very thick skin, such as we have on the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet, wear and tear. And as I said earlier, I'll talk about skin in a later lecture. Well, epithelia in other parts of the body, or in some parts of the body at least, are given special names. I'm not going to go through all the names here. You can read through these names. But the main th important point is that sometimes you'll come across terms like endocardium or endothelium or respiratory tract epithelium, or mesothelium, or olfactory epithelium. They relate to very special names we give to epithelia in certain parts of the body. And we'll come across these special names in later lectures. I mentioned earlier, when I spoke about the three characteristics of epithelia, that they have an apex, that they have a lateral border, and they sit on a basement membrane. So these cells have polarity. Recall from an earlier part of this lecture, I explained that epithelial cells exhibit polarity. And that means they have apical surfaces or apical domains. They have lateral domains and basal domains. Now, 
if you look at the diagram shown here and you look very, very carefully at the surface of the epithelium in the section imaged here, again, you can see that on the surface of the cells, there is a specialization called microvilli shown in the diagram. Microvilli are very fine structures that are one example of the surface epithelial specializations. So I'm going to now look at the apical borders of some cells and describe some of these surface specializations. They're unique to epithelia. They're different and they have very important functions. They include microvilli that we saw previously on this columnar epithelium. These microvilli are often called the brush border, particularly when we talk about tubes in the kidney or striated borders sometimes when we talk about epithelial cells such as we see here lining the intestinal tract or parts of the intestinal tract. Another surface specialization which is really like microvilli, but they're much longer, are stereocilia. And we find those in parts of the male reproductive system, particularly the ductus epididymis. But also, you see these very special stereocilia in the hair cells in the ear. And we'll talk about that more when we look at the ear at a later lecture. And then on the surface of the cells on the right-hand side, I showed these previously in pseudostratified epithelium. There are cilia, long hair-like structures projecting from the cell that help to move things along the cell surface. And sometimes we call this a pseudostratified ciliated epithelium because of the presence of these cilia in certain locations of the body, particularly the respiratory tract. Well, let's look at these surface specializations or modifications in a bit more detail, starting with microvilli or the microvillus. If you look at the histological section shown here, find the elongated nuclei of the epithelial cells. And then towards the surface, you can see some pale pink cytoplasm. But right against the clear lumen, shown here, you can see just a fine, darker pink line. That represents the microvillus border, the brush border or the striated border. On the right-hand side is a diagram illustrating the structure of these microvilli or an individual microvillus. It has a central core of actin filaments and those actin filaments project down into the apex of the cell and are connected to a parallel network of actin filaments called the terminal web. And the actin filaments that project up the microvillus are capped and linked to the tip of the microvillus or the tip of the cell membrane by the protein villain. And myosin also joins the actin filaments to the cell membrane or the plasma lemma. And along the terminal web, not shown here, there's lots of myosin II fibres and they're contractile. And what they do is they can contract and by contracting they can fan out these microvilli like fingers fanning out in my hand. And that increases the distance between microvilli and therefore exposes greater surface for absorption because these structures are specialised for very efficient absorption of water. They increase the surface area for that transport. Stereocilia are very similar. They're longer because the actin filaments are longer. They branch as well. And also they use different anchoring proteins to hold the actin filaments together into the terminal web and also to the cell membranes shown here. But essentially they're similar structures, specialised for absorption of fluid. Let's have a look at cilia. They're a totally different structure altogether. Again, 
look at the epithelial surface, you can see elongated nuclei of the epithelial cells, some clear staining cells. Well, right on the surface, you can see some little hair-like structures and a little dark line. Those hair-like structures are cilia. And the dark line you see are the basal bodies of all these cilia. The cilia are composed of what we call the axoneme. It's a special arrangement of nine plus two pairs of microtubules. And those microtubules enable the cilia to be motile. And the microtubules are inserted into the basal bodies at the apex of the cell. And all those basal bodies are actually connected in many ways to each other. And that allows the cilia to beat in unison together in one direction or the other and therefore move along the sur surface of the epithelium, foreign bodies, secretory products, or even cells. Let's now look and see how epithelial cells are joined together. Well, there are three different types of junctional complexes and they have three different sorts of functions. The first junctional complex is at the very apex of the cell, and they're called occluding or tight junctions. They're a barrier. They prevent material passing between the cells. It's important that the body can control what passes across or what is absorbed across the epithelial surface. And so these occluding or tight junctions prevent material passing through between cells. Now sometimes these occluding junctions can become a little bit permeable and do allow things to pass through, but that's controlled by the epithelial cells in certain locations. But essentially they present themselves as a barrier. They're also a barrier to the migration of components of the cell membrane. They separate the apical border of the cell from the lateral border of the cell. And that's very important because there's molecules in the apex of the cell and on the lateral surface of the cell that have very important functions. So it's important to separate these two domains. And one function of the tight junctions or the occluding junctions is to act as maintain the integrity of these two domains. Lower down in the diagram, you can see anchoring junctions. And there are two types of anchoring junctions. Some are called the zonular adherens, meaning they form a belt-like structure around the cell. The occluding junction do the same. These zonular adherens are actually attached to the actin filaments of the cytoskeleton. And they link the cytoskeleton from one cell to its neighbouring cell. The other type of anchoring junction is the desmosome or macular adherens. These are little spot junctional complexes, spot welds if you like, and they attach to the intermediate filaments of the cytoskeleton of one cell and also to another cell. So these anchoring junctions link the cells together so that the epithelium acts as a cohesive unit. And the remaining type of junction is the communicating junction, or a gap junction. These consist of proteins, connexons, which enable things to pass between the cells. Things like anions, nutrients, and various other chemical signals. So cells can communicate with each other via these gap junctions. And that's very important for smooth muscle cells to be able to contract in a sequential manner and also cardiac muscle to contract in a similar sequential manner. The lateral surfaces of epithelial cells also are very specialised. In this electron micrograph, there are interdigitations between projections of adjacent cells. These interdigitations are very important 
because they allow the distance or the space between cells to actually expand. And this is important sometimes in the transport of fluid. Normally, sodium pumps pump sodium into the space between cells in these lateral border regions. And chloride ions or anionic substances follow to maintain electrochemical stability. Now that immediately creates an osmotic gradient. So water passes then from the cell into these lateral regions. And on the other image you see the section through an epithelium of the gallbladder, you can see white clear spaces between the cells. This is an example of where water is passing from the cell into these lateral spaces and then the occluding junctions present, uh, prevent that water from then going to the surface. The hydrostatic pressure builds up and so the water flows back into the connective tissue underneath the cells and in, to be absorbed then by the body. And this is a way of the gallbladder being able to concentrate bile. The basal surface of cells also are very specialised. Here you see on the left hand side a number of mitochondria aligned along the basal surface of epithelial cells. There are also lots and lots of basal folds of the cell membrane. And that's because across this epithelial surface, there is a lot of transport of fluid as well and other substances. So the mitochondria are there to provide the energy for active transport and all the foldings is to increase the surface area for these transport proteins and transport channels. And when you look at the sections of epithelia that have these sorts of specialisations, they have a rather striated border. Like little stripes appear at the basal part of the cells that we call the striated border. And these are typical of striated ducts in protein secreting glands that I'll talk about when we look at glands in a later lecture. There they are there, shown on the image. Very fine pink striations. Another very important structure to consider when we're talking about epithelium is the basement membrane. Here is an epithelial surface. It happens to be pseudo-stratified ciliated epithelium and it's supported by a basement membrane which appears quite thick here. In other epithelia it's often difficult to see. I'm going to use the basement membrane only when I talk about epithelia. There's often confusion between the term basement membrane and the term basal lamina. Basement membrane really refers to the structure you see with the light microscope. Basal lamina is part of the structure you see using the electron microscope. There's actually another layer you can see using the electron microscope called the reticulate lamina. And the epithelial cells actually secrete components of the basal lamina, but connective tissue cells secrete components of the reticular lamina. And so in tissues like muscle and nerve, instead of using the word basal lamina, we use the word external lamina because the basal lamina usually only refers to the description of epithelia at the electron microscope level. But I just tend to use the term basement membrane when referring to epithelia and when looking at this epithelia with the light microscope. And you can see listed there a number of very important functions that these basement membranes fulfil in the body. I mentioned earlier that some epithelia contain a number of different sorts of cells and these cells have different functions. Here is an example of where epithelial cells have invaginated or grown down under the surface into the underlying connective tissue or lamina propria. 
And these cells become very specialised to be secretory cells or be glandular tissue. And that's going to be the subject of a later lecture that I'm going to present for you. So in summary, it's important you know how we name epithelia. It's important you know the certain specialisations on the surface of some epithelial cells, the sorts of ways in which cells are held together in epithelia and the way in which they're anchored by the underlying basement membrane. It's important you understand also that the anchoring of the epithelium into the underlying connective tissue is done by desmosomes similar to macular adherens, but they're called hemidesmosomes. So I hope you've enjoyed this lecture on epithelia. I hope you now appreciate what epithelia does in the body because you'll be able to use this as a way in which to identify different organs and different tissues of the body and the jobs these epithelia do. So thank you very much once again for listening to this lecture.